The 6 o'clock news starts right now. Yeah, and right off the top, we're going to begin with new information on that alleged human smuggling operation broken up by the Bexar County Sheriff's Office and Homeland Security investigations late yesterday afternoon. We were following it here on the 6 o'clock news yesterday. Well, federal officials releasing much more information about how they say this all went down in southwest Bexar County. According to the arrest report, it all started with Bexar County deputies getting a phone call from a concerned neighbor in the 11,200 block of Briggs Road. And that's where that neighbor reported seeing about 50 people getting out of a tractor trailer and then going into a mobile home on that property. When deputies got there, they say they saw several people getting into different vehicles. Deputies stopped four of those vehicles and the semi and then called Homeland Security. Investigators say those different vehicles were driven by three undocumented people and one U.S. citizen. Some refused to speak with investigators, but one that did told officials they were told to pick up the undocumented migrants by a woman they only knew as La Madrina. They were going to be paid $150 for each person they picked up. Now, one of the suspected smugglers was also found with $41,000 that they were instructed to pick up when they went and got the migrants. We're still sorting through the rest of these arrest reports, and we're going to have much more on this on the Nightbeat and also on KSAT.com. Now, we know seven people have been arrested for their alleged involvement transporting non-citizens. Yeah, but what happens with the others, not the smugglers, but their human cargo. Garrett Berger talks with an immigration attorney about what typically happens to those that are caught up in a bust like this. Three high profile cases in three weeks just here in Bear County. On the first, a chase with a van with immigrants locked in the back. On the 11th, a tractor trailer loaded with people on the far west side. Then Thursday night, a bust at a property in southwest Bear County. It seems to be a lot. Uh, it does. Lance Kurtwright is an immigration attorney here in San Antonio. He thinks policies like remain in Mexico and Title 42, which have blocked many immigrants, including asylum seekers, from entering the country legally, planned their decision to try another way. Well, they're making calculations, dangerous ones, where they'll get in the back of cars or get in the back of you know vans and come to the United States and, and try to come Ill illegally. If they're caught up in a smuggling bust, Kurt Wright says undocumented immigrants may be kept as witnesses against the people smuggling them before they're sent over to immigration officials but that doesn't typically help them in their deportation case. There are visa processes for victims of violent crime or sex trafficking. As a very general rule, people who have been smuggled in the United States on their own volition don't qualify for those programs. Many, Kurt Wright says, are seeking asylum, and they can still make that claim even if they're caught crossing illegally. Others, though, might be deported more quickly. The gamble they've made not panning out. Some of the individuals have, you know, had to rely upon criminal elements even to get up this far, um, which tells you how bad their situation must be at home that they're willing to take such terrible risk to get uh, here. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. In other news now is complaints about Medina Valley's athletic director and head football coach Swirl. The defenders are confirming that Lee Crisp failed a drug screening right before he was promoted to those high ranking positions. Now the flunk test is among a long list of allegations from community community members who have called on the district to remove Crisp. Other complaints include that he appeared to be under the influence at several school functions, refused to allow a football player to ride home with the team after a game in Lockhart in October, and also that he made fun of another player's lisp at back-to-back -back practices last fall. That teen's father says that it's time to remove Crisp permanently. Not one of these incidences are fabricated. I mean, they all come from upper leadership. They all come from coaches, teammates, uh, players, staff. Now, sources are telling our defenders that Crisp was placed on leave after community members came forward, but returned to work earlier this week. A district spokeswoman had previously referred to those complaints as, quote, rumors or unsubstantiated allegations. She turned 41 years old on Monday, but wasn't able to celebrate it with her family in person, marking two birthdays since Valerie and Gravaya disappeared. It's a missing persons case stretching all the way to Fort Worth, Texas. Our Jaffney Gray spoke with Inger Vaya's sister, who says they're beyond frustrated. People knew my sister as a tough chick. She rode motorcycles. Um, she worked in bars. 
Um, she was very well known and very loved by many people. Which is why Roxanne Mendiola says that she's constantly bombarded with questions on the whereabouts of her sister, Valerie Engorvaya. She disappeared November 29, 2019, on her way home to San Antonio after celebrating Thanksgiving with family in Fort Worth. She sent me messages, I'm on my way home, you know, and then um, I got a message in the Live 360, she turned off her, she turned off her location. And at first I was already like, mm, that's not Valerie, what's going on? That last phone ping was along Highway 173 between Hondo and Castroville. At the time, San Antonio police said they couldn't rule out foul play. Since her disappearance, life has been hard for Ingorvaya's mother, siblings, and five children. They missed their mother. They want their mother home. The family celebrated Ingorvaya's 41st birthday on Valentine's Day. Mendiola says it was a painful celebration, still not knowing anything about her sister's whereabouts. I'm praying she's alive. That's the one thing that I'm praying for. San Antonio police say Fort Worth police have taken over the investigation. It's been over two years since Ingorvaya disappeared. And now Mendiola says they're working with a private investigator, hoping for more answers soon. I'm going to bring my sister home one way or another. Jaffney Gray, KSAT 12 News. And now new at six, help for local foster kids. Did you know this? Only 3% of kids in foster care actually graduate from college. But now the Alamo Colleges District is doing something to change that. It's starting what's called the PATH program. Erica Hernandez explains how it's helping students who aged out of foster care. Andrea Contreras' path to college wasn't an easy one. As a foster child, she aged out of the system and didn't really know at the time college was an option. I think when you age out, you aren't told. A lot of times you are not told that you have so many options out there, especially when it comes to school. She ultimately made the decision to start at San Antonio College, but there has been challenges along the way. And that is when the fairly new PATH Foster Youth Program stepped in. What we're here for is to be an advocate for them and to help them um, go through those steps and become successful. The PATH program currently have a little more than 400 students involved. With anything from eliminating barriers to the first steps of enrollment. So we serve as a liaison for our students. And the program has been very successful and currently has a higher graduation rate than that of the national average. With the Alamo colleges, what we've been tracking is that our percentage is at 6%. It doesn't sound like a lot, but in but the grand, grand scheme of things, it's, it's, a, it's extraordinary. The program has also inspired Andrea to change career paths and now help other foster youths who were in the same position as she was. I know it's hard, but you have so much out there waiting for you. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. Check out traffic right now. Let's go to 35 and loop 410 on the north side. And you can see it is very slow going as those two major intersections come, major roadways come together. Again, north 35 at loop 410 as it heads north off towards Wurzbach Parkway and up in that neck of the woods. Well, tomorrow, a class at St. Mary's University will mark a dark chapter in America's history. It was the day that President Franklin Roosevelt signed the order in 1942, which led to the internment of millions of German, Italian and Japanese Americans during World War II. Many of them at a camp in Crystal City, just southwest of San Antonio. Jesse DeGriato tells us why those history students are asking you to join them in tomorrow's National Day of Remembrance. United States Department of Justice was responsible for the detention and supervision of all civilian alien enemies. Finally closed three years after Germany's surrender, the internment camp in Crystal City was where Werner Ulrich, standing next to his parents and baby sister, a German-American family from New York, had been confined as so-called enemy aliens. I remember standing at the fence, looking across the field, and it was wild brush. That's all I saw. And that was uh, like the end of the world. His father had been a school teacher at the camp. It was tough. My father was an angry man in the first couple of years. Angry, perhaps, like so many others who'd been rounded up and sent to internment camps, many with their children born in the U.S. Why are you here this morning? To remember the attorney. They are old and they're dying. We need to bring them peace. 
which is why 50 of Van Hoy students are rehearsing what they'll say Saturday morning. And I'm remembering today Annalisa Rend. And I'm remembering Arthur Jacobs. Honoring the children once held in those internment camps. Each of my students will pay tribute to one child and remember that child. She says by doing so, her students want to draw attention to the fact past presidents have honored Italian and Japanese Americans, the very reason why they say their campaign is on behalf of German-American children. They have not been commemorated by our U.S. government, so it seems kind of an exclusion to the German-Americans. I feel compelled to, to kind of speak on their behalf. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. Remembering our children also will have former internees sharing their stories via Zoom on a big screen set up for the outdoor event. It's going to begin at 11 a.m. tomorrow morning near the main entrance to St. Mary's University on Camino Santa Maria. All right, now let's take a live look outside from our south side cam right there. 59 degrees. I don't know why, but Adam seems super psyched about this, even though it's going to get a little cold, Adam. It's crisp outside today. Yeah. It definitely is. And if you're venturing out this evening or tonight, have a jacket ready because temperatures will be falling fast and you'll feel that chill in the air. 59 right now, dew point of 24. You look at readings and for the most part, we're right around that 60 degree mark. Bulverde, you're 58. 61 Divine, 63 in Hondo, 62 Bandera, but Seguin now at 56 degrees. All in all, we'll quickly be down in the 40s as early as about 9 p.m. And then early tomorrow morning, I think we'll be right near freezing to start the day. Of course, some outlying areas having a brief light freeze. Notice how those morning temperatures really climb quite a bit early next week. Another big temperature roller coaster is on the way. We'll talk about the weekend details and that temperature swing in just a bit. A fire spreads from one home to two others in San Antonio. Several dogs also found dead inside. Tonight, one of those homeowners not only speaking with us, they're also walking us through the damage left behind. Can't imagine if that was my house. Plus, at least three shopping centers on the west side have dealt with some type of theft or vandalism over the last couple of weeks. The shop owners and the tenants don't believe the crimes are connected, but they do know something needs to be done about it. They're calling on their councilwoman and police for help. We'll hear from them tonight on the Night Beat. And if you're planning on freshening up your home this weekend, be aware of a paint shortage. Contractors say the pandemic isn't the only thing to blame for this issue. Those stories and more tonight on the Night Beat. So now switching gears, we're going to talk about your heart. There's a lot of misinformation out there about your heart health. So our Ursula Perry is going to give us the facts. In the U.S., someone dies from heart disease every 36 seconds. It's the leading cause of death, and that's a fact. A lot of people suffer from heart failure. Over 5 million Americans in any given year will be diagnosed with heart failure. There's a lot of misinformation about heart disease, though. One of the biggest is that it only affects older people. Not true. Up to 10% of heart attacks happen in people under the age of 45. Another myth? That heart disease only affects men. Nope. Heart disease is the leading cause of death for men and women. In fact, about 5% of women are likely to be misdiagnosed when they go to the hospital with a heart attack as compared to 3% of men. Our last myth? That heart disease is colorblind. No, heart disease actually takes a heavier toll on minority groups. They were actually dying more than the white patients with cardiomyopathy. In a study, it showed a third of black people were more likely to die of it than the overall population. And more than 33% of American Indian people and Alaska Native people die from heart disease under the age of 65, as compared to just 17% of the overall U.S. population. And one more myth. Because you have a family history of heart disease, there's nothing you can do to avoid it. That is not true. People who have a high genetic risk actually can lower their odds by 46% simply by living a healthier lifestyle without smoking, adding exercise, and eating right. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. All right. We're going to take a, a look outside now. There's we, we got to get ready because we're going to get go through some swings. <laughs> We've uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I got up, drove in the day. I'm like, OK, I guess that cold front's done. 
Let's nope. move on. What's next? That one's done, but yeah, there's going to be another one, and we're going to feel it as we get into next week. With that cold front, we're not looking at any extreme temperatures, just a big temperature change during the middle of the week. So let's talk about today. Started off at 34 here in San Antonio, officially at the airport, but many outline areas, especially in the hill country, did dip below freezing. Then this afternoon, 63 for the high temperature. That's five degrees below average for the day. And Fredericksburg was stuck in the upper 50s along with Rock Springs. Del Rio made it to 66 and Gonzales. 59 the high temperature. All right, there is some colder air out there. It's not plunging our way yet. It's not going southward quite yet. It's going to be the middle of next week when the colder air dislodges from Canada and then marches southward here. But right now the coldest air right along the Canadian border teens, some single digits up there. Really not all that out of the ordinary for them this time of year around here. We're mostly right near 60 degrees. New Braunfels 57, Carrizo Springs at 61, Fredericksburg 55, and Catula right now at 63. So you average it out, we're right near 60. This is what we're anticipating tomorrow morning. Some upper 20s in parts of the hill country. The rest of us very close to freezing, if not just a degree or so below it. So another chilly start to the day tomorrow. Our weekend's going to start off with a quite a chill on Saturday morning in the low to mid 30s, but by the afternoon, we're back in the mid 60s, even upper 60s in some spots. Hondo Castroville about 68. The rest of us about 65, 66, the high temperature. Sunday, very simpler, very simpler, very similar on Sunday, very similar and pretty simple as well. Well into the 60s for a high temperature by Monday and Tuesday. Look at that jump. We're back in the 80s. OK, low to mid 80s Monday and Tuesday and then Oh yeah, here comes the cold front. Boom, we're back down near 40 for an afternoon temperature on Wednesday. Temperatures falling through the 40s throughout the day on Wednesday. So there's your big temperature drop and temperature swing coming the middle part of next week. This weekend, uneventful. Next week starts warm and then it cools off rather rapidly. And dew points will be changing as well. Right now we have the dry air dew points in the 20s. We're accustomed to that over the past several weeks, but actually by Monday, you're gonna notice some humidity back in the air. It's gonna be muggy first thing on Monday morning and even on the first part of Tuesday. And that's gonna lead to some morning fog. So when we do go back to school and work on Monday, anticipate some reduced visibilities for that morning commute. Nothing to worry about this weekend in terms of fog or any eventful weather, but back to work and school, likely a little bit of dampness out there Monday morning and that noticeable humidity. Quiet weather pattern. There's actually a little swirl in the upper levels just off the coast of California. That's dropping southward. It's just going to help throw some Pacific moisture our way and increase our clouds on Sunday and then a favorable pattern for some precipitation, just not here in our neck of the woods. These dips in the upper level flow, they're, they're coming, coming in from the Pacific Northwest. They're just not dropping far enough south to give us good rain chances. That's been the case for a while, and it looks like it's going to continue to be the case. So about a 20 to 30% chance of a few showers early next week. We're talking Tuesday and then even on into Wednesday. So we talked about tomorrow morning near freezing. By the afternoon, mid 60s, sunny, East northeasterly breeze at 5 to 10 by Sunday, increasing cloud cover. A very simple day, 67 the high and increasing humidity as well, which you'll notice on Monday, President's Day with the morning fog. And then there's that temperature drop. And with the temperature drop <laughs> falling through the 40s on Wednesday, of course, it's going to be breezy, a little gusty out there. We can't just have a cold front without some gusty winds with the cool air, right? Mm, all right. Thank you. All right. When it comes to the Hall of Fame, we have some breaking my news. <laughs> <laughs> How do I even get out of that? One? I'll Look, tell you what. There's, it's true. Manu could get into the Hall of Fame twice. One based on his NBA credentials, the other based on his international yeah, experience. Yeah. Exactly. So Manu Ginobili is a no-brainer basketball Hall of Fame finalist. Plus, in women's college basketball, Trinity is definitely on a roll these days. Coming up. Named a finalist as a player by the North American Committee, Manu Ginobili. Spurs great Manu Ginobili is one step closer to the Basketball Hall of Fame in big board sports.
Four-time NBA champion Manu Ginobili was named the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame finalist today. WNBA great Becky Hamlin was not among the 11 finalists. Manu, a first-time finalist, played 16 seasons with the Spurs, and he amassed 14,043 points, 4,001 assists, 3,697 rebounds, and 1,392 steals, and was honored with the NBA Sixth Man of the Year Award in 2008, as well as twice being named to the All-NBA Third Team. He's a very special human being and a very unique player who was uh, instrumental in us having success. The full Hall of Fame class will be announced during the NCAA Final Four in early April. Recently acquired Josh Richardson made his Spurs debut against the Thunder Wednesday night. San Antonio picked him up as part of the deal that sent Derek White to Boston. In his Spurs debut, Richardson scored three points in 14 minutes ago with one block shot, two assists while helping the Spurs win 114 to 106. The seventh year shooting guard is averaging 12 points per game for his NBA career. In women's college basketball, the Trinity Tigers have won a school record 21 straight games, improving to 22-2 overall this season and 15-0 in Southern Collegiate Athletic Conference play. Tuesday night, they won at Shriner University 88-75. The Tigers have three players averaging double digits this season. Maggie Shipley leads the way at 15.8 per game. Ashlyn Milton is next at 15.1. And Haley Coleman rounds out the top three at 12.7 points per game. They are the team to beat, having already locked up the top seed in the SCAC tournament that begins Friday, February 25th. We have a really solid roster of competitive players, and when you look at, you know, what you have to do defensively to game plan for the weapons that we have, it's a lot. Um, we have multiple options. We got shooters. We've got post players. We've got really strong ball handlers. So, you know, the players again, not to always give the credit to them, but they've done a great job of blending those talents together and creating a system that is, you know, it's tough to, to prepare for and tough to play against. Winning 20, 21 in a row is definitely harder than it harder than it sounds. I think that uh, a lot of these you know teams think that we're you know we're just unbeatable but we have our struggles we have our ups and we have our, our downs but at the end of the day you know this team is so resilient it can be very difficult to win you play teams and they know you have a lot to lose just by losing not necessarily to them but on a national and regional scale so to go 21 straight I think that helps us going into the postseason and with some of these tougher competition and with conference everybody's going to be playing better Trinity is ranked 18th in this week's D3Hoops.com national poll, and they'll close out the regular season on Sunday at the University of Dallas. Take it to the Berry Center in Cyprus for the UIL State Wrestling Tournament. Huge upset on the boys' side in the 138-pound bracket. New Braunfels senior Nathan Valadez going up against Langham Creek's Logan Soilo after trailing 6-3 at the end of the first period. Valadez takes the lead 8-7 with a pair of takedowns in the second. He'd survive a late charge to win 8-7 and advancing to tomorrow's state semifinals. On the girls' side, Smithson Valley senior Sage Benka dominated her first two matches, winning both by first period pin to advance to the semis. We'll have a lot more coverage of the state tournament on the BGC page at ksat.com. A lot going on high school sports-wise. Always busy, it seems like. Yeah, thank you, Larry. Now, up next, you're going to get a few minutes with one of the candidates vying to be your next Bear County judge. Our KSAT Q&A with Trish DeBerry is coming up after the break. And for much of this week, you've heard from some of the candidates who want to be the next Bear County judge. As a matter of fact, we interviewed the three major Democratic candidates earlier this week. You can catch those on KSAT.com. And whoever gets the job succeeds Judge Nelson Wolf, who has held that office for two decades. Uh, joining us now for the KSAT Q&A is Republican Trish DeBerry, formerly the County Commissioner for District 3. So we'll start here, Trish. Make your pitch. If you're the next county judge, what are you going to do for the people of Bear County? Uh, well, we're going to do a lot of fun, and Steve, it is so great to be here with you tonight. Um, you know, this was an incredibly difficult decision because I had to give up my seat. But as I talk to my family and my kids as a single mom and as a business owner in the private sector, um, and I really love the job as county commissioner, dug into a number of different issues, um, which, you know, were important to me, whether that was property tax relief, whether it was jail overtime, whether that was domestic violence whether that was you know, making sure the body camera footage was released in a timely fashion and we have one of the strictest 10 days. Um, and the elder fraud unit in the DA's office, I appropriated money for positions for prosecutor and investigator that have been vacant for five years because we have an aging population and they don't have the luxury of waiting on restitution or prosecution. So when we talk about what I wanna do as Bear County judge, 
you know, I want to dig in. I want to help to bring this community out of poverty. We've had the same poverty rate since 1982. And I want to lead this community out of a post-COVID environment with big ideas and a bold vision. And I think that's what I brought to the court as a county commissioner. I was a change agent. And I think people want that kind of leadership. They want folks to stand up, represent, make sure we're not wasting money, but also at the same time, moving this community forward. Talk about you talked about how tough this decision was. Obviously, running as a Republican, uh, there are a lot of people that say you already have an uphill battle when that happens, though I can think of some Republican candidates of one statewide race, Sheriff Palmer Lowe, you know, a few years ago. Yes. Uh, there, it has happened. But do you think it's an uphill battle as a Republican to win a countywide race like Bear County Judge? So I think certainly, Steve, look, um, from a county standpoint, when we look at, you know, what do the demographics look like? And there are a lot of people that will talk all day long about the fact that this is a blue county. But I will tell you that I think you know, it's going to be a very strong year for Republicans. And I think folks are fed up uh, with the current state of affairs, whether it's a 40 to 50 percent increase regarding prices at the grocery store whether it's, you know, filling up your tank at the gas pump um, and it's 80 to 90 dollars sometimes. And as we look at the invasion, perhaps into Ukraine, we can see gas prices escalate to six to seven dollars a gallon. And then we look at the border issue. Uh, there were a lot of problems from a crisis standpoint relative to that. So um, I think there's some dissatisfaction out there. And so as I looked at the environment and the fact that, look, I think that I've stood up for things that I thought were not just viewed through a correct political filter, but through a view of what is the right thing to do and having backbone to be able to get those things done. Super passionate, obviously, about what I have called a public health crisis in Bear County, which is the domestic violence issue that we have here. Um, dedicating resources, making sure as a part of the court that we allocated a record amount of money, $4.4 million. And let me just tell you, I was somewhat dissatisfied with that amount because the DA's office needs more than that. And the courts need more than that because women and children do not need to be living in fear. So those are some of the things why I think there's an opportunity for a Republican to take this seat and I am going to fight the good fight. So you mentioned that one of your biggest priorities is at the Bear County Jail. You listed that just a, a few minutes ago. Now, we know that the jail has been uh, over budget for years. How are you planning to control that spending? And I'm also going to dovetail this to and add this question. Um, how do you address the fact that there is a lot of overcrowding in the jail? It's also a problem because a lot of the people there can't afford to pay for their bail. Well, agreed. I mean, we've done some good things, I think, when we look at criminal justice reform and then when we look at how do we think differently about recruitment into the deputy sheriff's office and how do we deal with overtime? I was proud of the fact that I advocated very strongly uh, for a consultant to come in and take an outside perspective view, because that is what you do in the private sector. You benchmark against others who are doing things in an appropriate way. Um, and like I said, I hate to say that I have... Um, or what I call a restless discontent with the status quo. Um, but I'm never going to be satisfied with things just operating, like I said, status quo. We're not going to rubber stamp those issues. We're going to dig in and we're going to figure it out. And so I look forward to looking at the consultant that I vetted, uh, that I had come forward, that has a great reputation relative to what we can do at the Bear County Jail. But it's also, look, it's not just about the fiscal conservative nature as a Republican for the overtime issue. It's about humaneness at the jail, not just for deputy sheriffs or cadets that are working in that jail, because they were in humane conditions when you're working double, triple overtime shifts and you're not seeing your family. Um, it's also about the inmates that are in that jail and due process afforded to them. We've got a record number of deaths in the Barracana Jail. So there are things that we need to look at really critically and that we need to do differently. But I am super proud of the fact that I have the support and the endorsement and I had it from day one when I filed for the office of the Deputy Sheriff's Association because I stood up for them for cost of living allowance increases that they hadn't had for two years because those men and women are putting their lives on the line every single day. I also advocated with the judge, Nelson Wolf, and said we have got to get this collective bargaining agreement done. Really proud of the fact that we did get it done. They got their COLA increases and I am incredibly proud to have their support, um, just as I hope at some point to have the support of the San Antonio Police Officers Association. All right, we're running out of time here, but I want to give you the final word. 
Uh, if there's somebody out there that's thinking about it, obviously you have to win the Republican nomination, you know, on March 1st first before we move on to the general. We've talked a lot about general election stuff. So what's your message to people who are out there and on the fence about Trish DeBerry tonight? Um, so I would tell you, Steve, look, I think the thing that distinguishes me the most, not just from my Republican field, but from the Democratic field, is I have private sector experience. I've been a small business owner. Uh, for the better part of 25 years. I've signed the front of a paycheck and the back of a paycheck. I've had to deal with escalating healthcare insurance premiums every single day. I've had to hire and fire people. I've had to sustain a business uh, during downturns in the economy. And certainly I understand better than anybody what, the, what COVID has meant to small businesses and the downturn and the devastation associated with small businesses. So really the, the Office of County Judge is at largely an administrative CEO position. And that's exactly the wheelhouse that I bring to the table. So anyway, I look forward to representing and I've been very honored to represent and blessed to represent the constituents of Precinct 3. And what I have done in the first year, I fulfilled all my campaign promises in that first year. And I want to represent the entire county in the very same way. So all right. thanks for the opportunity to be here tonight. All right, Trisha Berry, thank you so much for joining us. The Republican candidate for Bear County Judge. Thank you for being with us today. Have a lovely weekend and we'll be right thank back. You. Avia calls it advanced rapid transit, frequent, fast, and the future of transportation. Plans for it have been in the works since 2020 and now a new milestone, which could mean federal dollars for the project. Traffic Authority Stephen Cavazos explains why it's full speed ahead for the Alamo City. Frequency, because frequency translates into convenience. ART will be high frequency service. Via President and CEO Jeffrey Arndt is talking about San Antonio's first ever advanced rapid transit system. It's part of the Keep San Antonio Moving Plan, which voters approved back in November of 2020. That secured funding for transit projects and improvements. And now Via officials are eyeing a capital improvement grant. You don't automatically get it. You have to meet the requirements. The CIG is a program within the Federal Transit Administration. The grant funds large capital project, but there's a list of requirements and that first starts with a favorable rating. Via asked the FTA for an early evaluation. Arndt says the response gave them the boost to drive forward. We have a project that the FTA is going to be willing to fund at the end of the cycle. Via is currently in the project development phase. The proposed line would stretch along the north and south corridor of San Pedro Avenue and connect the medical center to the airport and North Star area. Arndt says those are some of the most traveled roads for the working commuter. Via hopes the proposed ART will connect people to employment opportunities, especially those who rely on their service. The project still has miles to go, but Arndt says Via plans to stay ahead of the curve. Some of the features included in the north-south line are dedicated lines, off-board fare collection, and leveled platforms. The idea is to make trips fast and easy. VIA will host several public meetings throughout the year to get the community's input on any proposed improvements and overall design of the project. Now, the estimated completion date is slated for 2027. Reporting in the Traffic Lab, Stephen Cavazos, KSAT 12 News. Guys. All right, now we want to take things live outside right now. Ooh, nice. I mean, this is a perfect time of the evening, right? 57 degrees out there right now. You're getting a live look over 410 you, near the airport. You know, Caskey considers himself a little bit of a sunset connoisseur. That's right. Okay. Like there are things I'll go, wow, that's really odd. And he's like, yeah, it's okay. Oh. So I want to know how he rates this one. This one's really good. Yeah. Okay. All right. A time all lapse right. of it, and we've got some different vantage points. It's a really good sunset that we're uh, that we've been enjoying this evening. But if you are heading outside, have a jacket ready to go. And by nine o'clock, we're down in the 40s. And then by early tomorrow morning, I do think we'll start the day right near freezing. So a chilly start to your weekend. We'll talk about the rest of the weekend and another big temperature swing on the way in just a bit. All right, talking about the weather outside and the fact that uh, we've gone from cold to warm. A little tasty taste of everything. A little tasty taste of everything. Exactly. Tasty taste. I yeah. like the sound of that. A little, little tasty taste there. <laughs> and uh, another tasty taste coming as we get into next week. There's going to be a big temperature drop, but that doesn't mean we're going to see some extreme cold. It's just going to take us from higher up in the 80s down even down into the 40s. So another chilly night tonight. Grab the jacket of venturing out 60s for high temperatures this weekend. 
Then early next week we get into the 80s before the next temperature drop comes. Those are your headlines, but also another headline we need to add to it. The beautiful sunset that we've had this evening. Here's one shot on our KSAC Connect app. It's a beautiful shot there from San Antonio, but we also have a time lapse here. Of course, I've got the camera set up just right. Saw those clouds streaming overhead and thought, here we go. So here it is. Feast your eyes on this beautiful, beautiful sunset. I slowed it down nicely just so we could really enjoy it and see those color changes there off the base of those mid-level clouds. Earlier this morning, 34 degrees, then high temperature of 63. So far this month, we are more than five degrees below average. We've seen a fairly even split so far of above and below average days, but the below average days have been well below average. And so that's thrown off our uh, our averages this this uh, so far this month. The coldest we've had, the coldest temperature, 21. That was on the 4th. The warmest, 80. That was on the 16th. And I think we're going to exceed that early next week. Right now, pretty similar temperatures across the Lone Star State, 50s and some 60s. 56 in Midland right now, Houston 55, Laredo 63, along with Hondo. But the rest of us quickly falling down into the 50s now. Soon to be followed by the 40s and then the 30s later on tonight. What, the, what we're anticipating tomorrow morning is basically right near freezing again. So just like earlier today, near the freezing point in the morning, and yes, some areas just dipping a little below freezing briefly, especially in the hill country. Then by tomorrow afternoon, we make it back into the 60s, about upper 60s west of town, Uvalde 69, Del Rio even 70 degrees. But we're thinking here in San Antonio about 65. So pretty straightforward tomorrow afternoon and again on Sunday. A surge of warmer air and actually some humidity Monday and Tuesday. It'll feel a little spring like then. Temperatures low to mid 80s. Morning fog with that humidity as well on Monday. Just something to keep in the back of your mind. And then here comes the temperature drop. Boom, we bottom out. We go from the mid 80s on Tuesday to falling through the 40s on Wednesday. So a 40 degree temperature drop just like that. Again, the low temperatures are not going to be extreme. I think we'll just have a brief light freeze with that cooler air for the middle part of next week. Quiet weather pattern at the moment. The moisture that we had in parts of North Texas and then the East Coast, that's all off over the Atlantic now. That's moved. That system has moved on. There's a little swirl just west of San Francisco. That's going to drop southward. It's not a big disturbance. It's just going to th throw some clouds our way from the Pacific as we get into Sunday. Of course, we could use some moisture around here. 78% of Texas considered in drought. As for us, it's Dimmit, LaSalle, McMullen counties, but even locally in and around San Antonio and surrounding counties, we do still have the ongoing drought, particularly the farther south you are of San Antonio, the more you in drought, the drier you are, unfortunately. Looking better, though, in Comal County compared to surrounding areas. As for rain chances, we're stuck in this pattern where we do get big disturbances near us, just not over us. So we're looking at a 20 to 30% chance for the early and middle part of next week. So unfortunately, no good chance of rain anytime soon. Just a few hit or miss opportunities into next week. So near freezing tomorrow morning on your Saturday, then mid 60s and sunny for the afternoon. Light breeze out of the east northeast at 5 to 10. Sunday morning, not as cool. 42 degrees by the afternoon, still well into the 60s. And there's that big temperature drop next week. But look at the lows, just near freezing again by Thursday morning. So at least we're not going to see the bottom really fall out for overnight temperatures. Just wish we had more rain with it. Yeah, some sort of moisture. That's what we need. I know we've just had these nuisance little sprinkles and damp mornings, and that's about it. All right, thank you. Now, in case you missed it, it's coming up next. Here's today's I see why am I? Morning, everybody. It's Friday, February 18th. Medina Valley Independent School District's board meeting was full of tense moments last month as a flurry of complaints against head football coach and athletic director Lee Crisp were brought into the light. A brush fire we showed you first at five yesterday in South Bear County, now considered to be arson. It burned through several acres, but it also burned through several homes in the area. The fire starting around three o'clock along Sea Spray. It's an unincorporated part of Bear County. Multiple homes had to be evacuated as a precaution. Speaking of fires, three families without their homes after a fast spreading fire around 930 this morning here in town. We've just learned some of them 
are without their puppies as well tonight. San Antonio Fire Chief Charles Hood says the flames started at one home, then spread to two more. All eight people inside the homes made it out safely. Animal Care Services called in to help find some missing pets. They say they did find four dogs but four puppies died in those fires. Before you make the baby's formula, an urgent recall of some powdered Similac, Alimentum, and Elicare. The FDA is investigating four infant infections, including one in Texas and including one death. Great news today for avocado lovers. The ban on avocados imported from Mexico has been lifted. The U.S. Embassy announcing today that avocados can resume being imported into the U.S without inspections. They were halted last week after one U.S. inspector received a death threat in Michoacan. This means consumers and restaurant owners won't see higher prices just yet. Tomorrow morning down in the 30s for most of us right around freezing into the hill country. We'll have some upper 20s, so a cool start to your Saturday by the afternoon. We get back into the 60s with a lot of sunshine. Von Army about 68 degrees. We'll hit 70 in some outlying areas further west of town near the Rio Grande. Sunday, more of the same into the 60s, but you'll notice some increasing clouds on Sunday, and I wish that was going to lead to some rain, but unfortunately, I think it's just going to bring us some morning fog on Monday with noticeable humidity. There's that temperature drop next week from the 80s Monday and Tuesday down into the 40s by Wednesday. All right, thank you. We'll see you tonight on the Night Beat at 10.